Well, I'm very grateful to be here and uh, I'm excited to be sharing some thoughts and insights with you right now. So um, I will get started despite the fact that we can hear me in stereo. I will push past that. So my name is Leila Ajaralu. I'm a designer and a sociologist and I'm very deeply passionate about how we can use design as a tool for creating change in the world. So my background was I wanted to do something creative, so I uh, went to design school. And then I realized that design was perhaps maybe one of the tools that was creating the problems that I had, was motivated to help solve. Um, and so I ended up going and studying uh, social science and uh, sustainability, because I was like, humans seem to be part of this problem, as well as um, this kind of big area of like what it is that humans do to the environment and how that affects us. So, a long story short is I decided to kind of carve a career um, in designing tools that help other people make change. And so this, this is kind of one of the driving forces of what I do in my work, which is how do we design a world that works better for all of us, right? So it's not just one that works better for certain people in certain countries or certain socioeconomic positions, but how do we make the goods and services, the systems, the societies, so that we are all flourishing together. Now, obviously, that's a big <laughs> challenge, but one that I personally am really committed to doing, and so much so, a few years ago, I was uh, named, uh, literally, this is a real thing, champion of the earth by the United Nations. That's a title I have for the rest of my life, which obviously is great, but also a little scary. And after this happened, I really reflected on what it meant to be a champion for the earth. And um, we developed, actually, this, this superpower toolkit of the 12 everyday superpowers that every human on this planet has to help make sure that we can make the world um, in a more kind of positive place for everybody. So my, my favorite is like the power of you know, being wrong, <laughs> being able to acknowledge when you do something that might not be right. Um, this is all free on the internet and, and I always uh, encourage people to pick a superpower that they identify with. Um, my favorite is uh, the power of systems thinking uh, but also the power of learning to love problems because I see that every problem holds its own solution. So in my work, in my, my professional practice, um, I do a lot of different uh, creative toolkits. I design experiences and I've worked with beautiful institutions like this one to create immersive experiences where you think differently about the way things are created and the role that we play in the world. I also am a serial social entrepreneur. I can't help myself, it's terrible. I keep waking up in the middle of the night with new ideas. I have a design agency based out of the US. I have a school that's global called the Unschool and I have a farm here in Portugal that I set up as a living learning laboratory. Let me talk through a little of this because I think um, for me, this is about uh, finding ways of engaging and inspiring other people. So uh, the Unschool, an experimental knowledge lab for adults, is where we teach people the tools of systems thinking and sustainability and, and we have people from all over the world who have come to this school. We have, um, you have designers, you have social entrepreneurs, but then we also have like people working in big corporations who wake up one morning and they're like, what am I doing? And so they like Google, <laughs> you know, school for rebels and they come to the unschool. And it's great because we have this really emerging community of people um, that are from all over the world, from uh, different countries. We've run programs in, in many countries, including like we've been to uh, Rio, we've been to, uh, to Mumbai, to Kuching, to Melbourne, Australia, where I'm from. And the goal of this is not only to create community and to give people those collaborative tools to make change, but to also be realistic that for every single person on this planet who cares about the environment and other people, there's a lot more of you. You're not the only one. And I think that sometimes we become very um, insular and we get overwhelmed. And so I've been personally inspired as somebody who created this school by all the people who have come to it. And we do all this stuff around personal and professional development. But the goal of this has always been to give people the tools to learn to love problems. Because I think one of our big issues in society is that when we encounter a problem, the tools that we've been given through our education is to avoid the problem and to make the problem go away. And the problem with that is that we don't really understand what's going on. So this idea of learning to love a problem, like I always suggest people go on a date with the problem that they're trying to solve, you know, like really ask it questions, not try and impose judgment on it until you've really figured out if you like it or not. Because without knowing whether it be a social issue or an environmental issue, what's truly going on, we often just avoid or dismiss things. So this goal is, was inspired by one of my heroes, who's a, a, was a design architectural pioneer, Buckminster Fuller, who said that if you want to predict the future, you need to design it. 
And this is something that I get goosebumps every time I say, because at the end of the day, we are also living in a time where the outcome, how bad or good this pandemic evolves to be, is a result of our action. And so to me, this is a really beautiful opportunity. And, and in my own practice, I wanted to explore this. So three years ago, I took on an abandoned olive farm in the center of Portugal. Um, and I renovated the entire thing using sustainable design principles and also uh, regenerated the agricultural component of which I had no idea. Like I'd literally grown one tomato plant in my life before this moment. And my learning journey was like this with a lot of kind of falling off, but a uh, very, very fascinating experience of learning how to create a really positive ecosystem. And to also, this was before, this was after, I mean, it's just the buildings, but the whole, the whole infrastructure um, was designed in such a way to create a space for um, living, learning from nature, but in a very kind of contemporary space. And in the time that I spent there uh, building it and learning from it, these are three things that I learned, right? And this is that there's no such thing as waste in nature. Nature does not create something that does not have value somewhere else. Humans create that. And that you get out what you put in. If I didn't go in in the morning and weed or water or do the things, then I wouldn't get vegetables that I wanted to eat. So this is a very simple thing. You know, you reap what you sow. That comes from agriculture. <laughs> and for a good reason, because you do truly, in life, get out what you put in. And everything that is designed in nature is done so to optimize life. And this was one of the things that I found so fascinating because when you're in a rural environment or in nature for a long time, you become very observant of the system. The system starts to teach you things that you didn't even realize. And um, I'm gonna go into that in a little more detail when I talk about some of the learnings, but I wanted to just switch gears and talk about some of the, the work that I've been doing to help advance sustainable lifestyles and living. Because for me, if we wanna design a future that works better, we have to have ways of engaging with our daily life and practice that helps us become more um, active citizens in the world. And so the UN, uh, commissioned me and my organization to design a tool that would help people anywhere in the world think differently about their lifestyle choices. So the outcome was called the anatomy of action. Most people in the world have at least one of these. It's a hand and it reminds us every day of the choices that we make, the things we buy, the way we move around our city, um, the food we eat, the money we spend and the impact that that has, as well as the fun things we do. And so we actually did some research around the last five years of peer-reviewed scientific papers that look at like if lots of people change their behavior on these categories and what kind of massive impact, positive impact could we have? And we found this very unique little kind of beautiful thing which we are in the middle of right now with the COVID crisis that humans are more likely to change their behaviors when they have a life disrupting activity, have a baby, move house, move country, or have a global pandemic. Right? We are more susceptible to our behaviors being adjusted and less resistant to them when we're not in a you know, steady state stream. And so this was what we tried to find, ways that you could intervene in everyday actions and make it fun and engaging. And, and essentially it was to create content that was able to be intervened with by anyone. And so if you go online and you go on Instagram, you'll see that people have translated this to Farsi and to many different languages and to really try to engage their community with these actions. And if we just take food, for example, which is one of the things that we all do every day, we engage with the agricultural world through buying uh, food and obviously creating waste, whether that be food waste or other forms of waste that needs to be escorted from our houses in, through pipes so that we don't have to deal with it. Um, that this whole system, the way that humans have created the world to meet their agricultural needs has caused massive environmental and social issues. So not only is 20% of our global carbon emissions directly attributed to agriculture. Um, we also have seen a massive transformation in the types of agricultural production. So we used to have animals and livestock roaming the fields and eating, but now they're often in factory farms and they're fed grains, which I recently learned creates a lot of burping cows, not farting. And that contributes to methane and methane is a 25 times more potent greenhouse gas. So the studies show that if we could reduce the reliance on these systems alone, we could really dramatically change our carbon um, emissions as a species. And the same applies to our actions at our home. Like a lot of people overbuy food and food waste, up to a half of all of the world's food produced is wasted, not just by us at the home, but it's quite high. It's one of the higher per percentages. 
And this is an issue because when we go and waste an apple or we throw something in the, the trash and if it ends up in landfill, which in many countries in the world, we still bury our waste, then it creates this, um, this uh, greenhouse gas called methane or methane, depending where you are in the world, which is a 25 times more potent greenhouse gas than carbon dioxide. So if you think about it, okay, say you buy a lettuce you don't eat your lettuce because it goes soggy in your fridge, which is a very common problem. And so you throw that lettuce in the trash, it goes and sits in landfill, creates methane. But the other problem is that you were gonna eat that lettuce and you still need to get some sort of food or nutrients. So then you go and buy something else. So it creates these like big systems interventions because food waste, it has this like flow on effect. So for me, these kinds of systems at play, they teach us that of course, our individual actions, they have impacts, but also these systems can be disrupted and changed. So one of the things I learned from my farm, <laughs> I want to tell you a story from farming um, in a minute, but I want to start by telling you about um, this COVID crisis and the relationship between the impact on our lives and the natural environment. So there's a direct correlation between the areas that have had a higher rate of uh, deaths and causal, uh, uh, casualties with air pollution. Now, air pollution normally kills four to seven million people every single year, right? Air pollution is a huge, huge global health problem. And air pollution comes not only from like factories, but also from uh, cars and many different sources. And uh, the thing is, is that now we're seeing not only that, but that there is a direct relationship between the way that we are uh, moving our cities, our cities are encroaching on natural spaces, we have more uh, closer connection to to the natural world, but the, 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 the natural world, the animals, they have to move because of climate change as well. So all of these factors are coming together to create this like perfect storm for zootopic diseases to jump species. And as we all know, as I look at you all with your delightful face masks on, <laughs> that we are living in a time of, 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 of us really interfacing with our problems. Like the, these are a direct outcome of our actions because we live on one planet I would love to think that we could all go and live on another. It's not f feasible because we need to breathe oxygen. We as biological beings have a, we are born of this planet and we need the services that this planet provides to us for free, otherwise we don't live. So for me, realizing that we live on a planet with limits and this crisis is showing us some of those limits very viscerally. And so I feel like it's an amazing time to reflect on some of these actions and to really disrupt the way we we build our economy into the future. So I've built lots of tools to help kids think about this, like uh, this one project with Finland was called the Circular Classroom, and it, it teaches young minds, not even that young, like teenagers who are about to go out into to their professions, how to think in systems, how to think about the relationships between things, because a lot of our education has reinforced what we call the mechanical worldview. This idea that the world is a machine and that it's predictable <laughs> It's not predictable <laughs> at all. And that it's methodical, that the parts move together nicely. And this worldview was born out of an incredible theorist, of, of, of scientist, obviously we all know who Newton is and his theories of relativity. relativity. But what also we, we have gained from this new way of thinking about the world from 350 years ago or so, was this idea of reductionism, of breaking the world down into individual and manageable parts and to not see it as a whole system with these complex dynamic elements that when one thing changes here, something else changes over here. And this system of reductionism, it, it applies to our businesses, our schools, our governments and our societies. And the problem with this is that it's created this linear system, this very structured and rigid system where we go and extract things from nature, we turn them into usable goods and then we waste them. And if you forgot, I said there's one thing in nature that waste doesn't exist. Humans are the only species that truly create something that has no value and we sever it from the system. And so this system has created lots of problems, like a significant amount, whether we look at um, the sixth great extinction, climate change, air pollution, uh, ocean plastic waste, like there is a long laundry list of problems that we are facing. My goal is to not depress you all, it's to give you the tools to overcome that. Because the thing is, is that when you look at nature, the thing that we are all part of, that we rely on every single second of every single day to survive, because we all breathe oxygen and we all eat food, it only knows how to solve problems. Nature is regenerative. Regenerative is when you give back more than you take. And yes, of course, something dies or one species comes and like there's, a, there's locust plagues in 
you know, but that's because there's something wrong with the system. Because everything in nature is trying to optimize life, so there's this relationship between things. So when we look at the world through this lens of us being interdependent, that we are in a relationship, then it changes the way we see. We go from this linear worldview to this more dynamic and systems-focused worldview. So let me share a story with you about an orange tree on my farm. Um, I, I became the beneficiary of somebody else's foresight. One family owned this farm for 100 years, and they planted lots of citrus and olives and lots of different trees. And every time I picked an orange, I would think, I am now reaping the rewards of somebody else's hard work, which is the concept of intergenerational equity, the idea that each generation should give each generation after them something more and this generation is the first to steal, intentionally steal from future generations in the way that we, we uh, ignore climate change or ignore the future that, they, that the young people will be or we will also be um, responsible for. But so I would pick these trees and one day I'm picking an orange from this great orange tree, had delicious oranges, and I just I happened to notice a few little ants, just a few, like, okay, ants, they're normal. We see ants all over the place, right? But I happened to notice them and I was like, that's really weird that they're climbing up that tree trunk. And then I went about whatever, doing other things. And then I happened to be at another plant and I noticed these little guys called aphids. Does everyone, I don't know what it is in Portuguese, but an aphid, they, they're tiny little guys. They can be black or white. They're under the leaf. And they, they, what they do is they suck the nutrients. They're these little prongs and they suck the sugars out of the plant. Okay, now they don't actually need all their sugars. So they poop out a kind of stickery, sticky, sugary mess that then you can see the trail of underneath your, your leaf or of your plant. I'm sure it, it often affects house plants as well. So the thing about aphids is that they destroy the, the new part of the plant. So it takes the energy and the plant often kind of shrivels up and dies. So I start to notice aphids somewhere else. Well, that's a problem. I start to notice ants somewhere else. Like I would stand somewhere and I'd be covered in ants and I was like, no correlation between these two factors at this point in my life. And then I happened to notice that beautiful orange tree, all its little leaves were curled over. So I got up under the tree into the canopy and holy crap, there was a infestation of aphids. Like under the little green leaves, it was all black. And I was like, oh my God, what do I do? So I get on the internet, of course. <laughs> and I'm like, aphids, why? And it turns out that aphids are farmed by ants. So what it turns out is there is a symbiotic relationship between ants and aphids. And during the winter, ants take aphids, just a few of their best crop, and they store them in their nest until the springtime when all the new shoots come and they carry them up to the beautifulest, nicest leaf and they place them there and then they use their antlers to massage their bellies so that they produce more sugars that they then harvest to feed their young. They farm aphids like we farm chickens. Once they don't want an aphid any longer, it's not producing enough sugary poop, they eat it. Think about it, it's like eggs and chickens. So clearly this blew my mind. I was up all night thinking about ants and aphids because this shows that the thing is, is that this whole system is designed for success. Okay, in this case, the ants are more dominant. The aphids are benefiting because the aphids become actually addicted to their bellies being uh, massaged and so and they're, because they're getting carried around like kings you know they don't have to walk anywhere and even to the point where lady beetles are the natural enemy of aphids the ants will go and kill lady beetles to stop them from from destroying their crop so imagine I'm farming and there are ants farming it's just this levels and this is one other thing I learned about the world from this work that I did on the farm is that Nature just replicates the same system over and over again. It's beautiful. It's like at the micro level and at the macro level, it's the same system. And this to me is just, it's rich with knowledge and information on how we can be um, more responsive to the system rather than try and control it. So anyway, I had to develop some like, do you wanna know what I did? Yes, of course. Now I feel like I have to tell you how I solved the problem. It's still ongoing, but I found that if you mix eco, um, like a, a natural dish soap, just a little bit, and olive oil, because of course in Portugal, olive oil fixes everything, truly, <laughs> right? I can't tell you how many things, people are always like, do you have butter? I'm like, it's an olive oil farm. No, we have olive oil. Anyway, it, and you mix that, and what happens is you spray it on the, the tree, and it, it clogs the, the oil clogs the, um, the pores of the, the, the aphids, and they die, right? The problem is, is the ants are smart, 
and they go and they take their like best aphids and they move them to another tree. So it's like this battle, you're in like a symphonic dance with the ants and the aphids and, and some olive oil spray, but it is becoming under control and you can also introduce, increase the introduction of these kinds of critters um, to help uh, manage the system. But what this shows us is that the world is made of these constantly changing and dynamic systems. It's not a homogenous, linear, structured machine. It is not a machine. <laughs> Yet somehow, we've all lived in this world where we're taught that by breaking the world down into manageable parts, we will all be successful in kind of dominating and controlling the planet and getting all our iPhones and everything else that makes our lives more enjoyable. And in one sense, we've been really successful in the last 70 years until perhaps this crisis, <laughs> we were doing pretty well as a species of dominating. But what we're seeing now is that our actions, they have consequences. And in this case, we need to learn how to work within these dynamic systems. So the thing is, is that our entire world, everything we know to be our world, our reality, is fueled by natural resources. The chair you're sitting on, those disposable masks you're wearing, these are all materials that at some point have to be extracted from nature. And at some point, will be returned, right? Like, at some point, we have to put things back in this system. And so what we're trying to do is like a global community of, of people looking to make positive change is transform from a linear to a circular economy where the materials, so say these like biodegradable materials like that lettuce I talked about, that it gets re-metabolized back into nature in a benign way, right? Or you have uh, technical materials, say like your cell phone, that we know have like 50 or 60 different metals and hyper complicated, but they're designed so that they can be recaptured, reconditioned, reconfigured, and put back into the economy, right? So we're operating like nature does, we're metabolizing things. So this concept is uh, it's a well-known concept, the circular economy. We've been working on it in different forms for decades, like you all would know the reduce, reuse, recycle mantra that came out in the 80s, which was one of the first attempts to try and get humans to be a little bit more conscious with their materials. But what I want to give you is this metaphor, again, something I learned from the farm, and it's, I call it the mushroom model, because what we have is a giant metabol uh, metabolism, that's what Earth is. We all have a metabolism, you put food in your body, microorganisms, billions of them, extract nutrients, they power your body, and they create other things that go away, which I could talk about at length, but I won't. But this system is a metabolism model, right? A city is a metabolism. The whole world is one giant metabolism. So in, in this kind of um, theory of what we call the iceberg model, which is a, is a systems thinking approach to understanding problems, so most of the time when we encounter a problem as a human, we just see the obvious. We just see the thing that's obvious to us. But we know that that's not really the cause. So you might hear this idea of systemic, the systemic cause, so the iceberg model forces us to look at the structures and the models that reinforce the problem. And this idea really made me start thinking about what happens when you see a mushroom. It's always magical when you see a mushroom on the side of the road, right? Like you're like, how did that grow there? So it turns out that the mushroom is just an emergent outcome of a very complicated system called mycelium that runs all through the earth. And the world's biggest living organism is one mycelium network, meaning one whole network of um, of, of, of mycelium that's connected. So the mushroom is the outcome. The mushroom is the demand or the need for the, the mycelium to spread its spores because basically in that little, the little cap is where you have the spores that go out to try and pollinate or colonize and create more mycelium. Now, what do you think the role of mycelium is in the earth? It runs all through the earth. You would see it sometimes if you dig a hole, you'll see these little white lines. What do you think it's doing? Obviously, you're not going to be able to respond. You're all wearing masks. <laughs> but the, the reality is, is that that is acting as the neurological network for the trees. And actually, mushrooms and trees have a symbiotic relationship where um, the mushroom is, uh, it's not photovoltaic. It can't, it's not photovoltaic. It's not out in the world. Like, it's not um, photosynthesizing, right? So trees photosynthesize. They take sun and they turn that into nutrients. And the mushroom can't do that. But the mushroom can send other resources because it runs all through the earth for the mycelium. And so it connects to the root structure of the tree and it basically operates as the messaging system in exchange for resources from the tree, right? So what that shows us is that 
deep under the earth, what looks really passive and quiet is actually this like information superhighway um, between the different parts of the system. And I, I remember being totally mind blown by this, um, this, this phenomena that happened in the savannah in Africa where there was this, it was a few years ago, there was this mass death of these, I don't know what animal they are, they look, they've got like, you know, savannah animals with horns. I don't remember the elk. No, I don't think it's elk. Anyway, you get what I mean. It looks like a horse, but not a horse or zebra. Anyway, um, so this animal, I think it's an elk, they just started dying, like in mass, like thousands of them. And they couldn't, scientists could not figure out why. And what ended up happening was they discovered that the acacia tree, that one of the main trees in that area, was being defoliated because there were too many of these, let's call them elk. I don't think they were, but let's just call them that. Um, these uh, guys eating them. And the tree responded by creating a toxin that when the animals ate, it expanded their stomachs and they hemorrhaged from the inside and died because they found all the animals with these ginormous stomachs. But the tree, the first tree that was being eaten, it sent a pheromone or a signal under the ground. So it was the next trees that created the toxin. Isn't that amazing? Doesn't that just blow your mind how the, the system can respond to an element that is so clearly damaging and it's telling its friends like guys there's these predators coming along put the toxins in your you know in your mix and so you have this incredible dynamic response to the world around us so for me every time i look at the natural world i learn methods for how we can solve the problems that the human world has created and this is really what this kind of methodology of the circular economy is and we're seeing this grow all over the world and what's really exciting is in this moment in time with the crisis that we have is that certainly here in Europe and many other countries they're talking about building the, the rebuilding the economy with this at the forefront versus the extractionary and the linear one so as I said there's no such waste in nature nature is like this incredible uh, recycler because it bre breaks everything down just to be the raw materials that you need to build something new but us humans us humans hello <laughs> us humans have created this system of devaluing nature, right? This is the reality. And we have the, the motivator for devaluing nature is that we have infinite desires, mainly for stuff, mainly for things that make us feel good, like wine and cheese and technology and airplanes. And they're not inherently bad by any means. They help the system, the economy be, like, uh, exist, <laughs> but they have elements of the way they interact with the broader system that creates significant problems. So let's just look at this concept of value here, okay? Value is totally in the eye of the beholder, okay? So I like to give this example that here in Europe, 500 years ago, a single pineapple fetched around $10,000 on the market because they were so rare. Pineapples were, were impossible to grow here. They were a high source of natural sugar. They were so popular that um, you can go to parts of the UK and there are buildings that have pineapples on top of them. If you went to a party with a pineapple, you were literally the most important person there, so you could rent them. There was a pineapple renting service. That's how popular they were. But nowadays, we buy a pineapple, a couple euros, don't even think about it. Probably waste half of it, because you have to cut it all off from you know, the eyes and everything else. But if I ask you how much you would spend on a diamond, you would probably spend $10,000 on a diamond. But a diamond is inherently valueless. They are very, very, very abundant in, the natural, in the, world, the natural world. They're not rare. The rareness is the, the model of the, the, the cartel that is an openly known cartel now that was built up to create this concept of value, to create this idea that this thing is rare and beautiful and valuable and therefore create this, this obs obsession with spending a lot of money on it. So here we've created these systems of value being very much um, determined based on status or novelty or um, what someone's posted on Instagram. <laughs> so, but this, I want you to really think about value here because what I'm arguing is that we as a species have made it so easy to devalue nature, but nature is the most valuable thing that we have because without it, we have nothing. So we need to reconfigure the way we value the services that sustain life because without that we have no sexy cars or delicious dragon fruit right so this concept this is changing the mental model it doesn't mean you all have to go out and hug a tree by any means i've tried that it gets quite dirty um, and sometimes results in spiders in awkward locations 
but to really learn to value the things that come into our lives, whether it be a material form or then the, the way we can um, change the conversation about the problems that we have in front of us from being ones of like, oh, we just need to lock nature up or protect it or preserve it. No, we are inherently reliant on these systems. Therefore, we need to change the way we value things in the economy. So this now gets me to this bigger point about humans and the economy. So we all know we're in, in am I allowed to swear? We're in a crappy economic situation. I was going to say another one replace crap with another word, where we are really suffering and we will continue to suffer, I think, for some time now. But I think part of this problem isn't that we just shut down the economy, it's that our economy is inherently re uh, um, reliant on extraction and exploitation. So that because of those two elements, we extract things from nature and we exploit human labor, we exploit the natural system, that is an inherently systemically uh, incorrect element of our economy. And historically, there, there was a, a big issue with the way the economy, the current economy was created. In 1935 or something, this guy called Simon Kuznicz, he was an economist um, in the US and he had to uh, calculate whether or not the United States could recover from the Great Recession and enter the First World War if they had enough resources within the country to, to, not, uh, to, to still feed their people. And he created the concept of gross domestic product. And he himself even stated that it is an absolutely horrendous tool to measure the wealth of nations because it doesn't account for human side. It doesn't account for the values outside of the very rigid idea of what goods and services are available and produced in an economy. And for the last 70 years, GDP has been the only mechanism of success that our economy has, has been uh, built on. And so here we are with this system that ultimately is very, very myopic. And so one of the big challenges we have is we have to be able to rebuild with this concept of like the small things and the big things at the same time. I always challenge people to be able to think through the telescope and look at the infinite possibility of the universe and the microscope. And when you look at both of those, you see something very similar. Again, these things are all just repeated. So, for me, this is about, I have no idea how much time I have left here. It's about a big cultural shift. And uh, again, my favorite, uh, <laughs> my favorite uh, hero, Buckminster Fuller, talks about if we want to make change, then we have to design a new system that makes the old one obsolete. Now, we're in a beautiful time right now because that's happening whether we like it or not. And these dramatic disruptions to not only our way of life, but our understanding of what is valuable. Who here has valued something differently as a result of these last three months? the time you spend with friends. I value hugs so differently right now because I have a hug deficit in my life. <laughs> I va we value time with friends and family. We value things so differently now because of this experience. And this to me is a really profound moment to reflect on how we can move from this extractionary and linear economy where we essentially create these infinite problems that we make other people's responsibility to one where we understand that that we can, um, we can create value through the things that we design and the things that we use. And I wanna just touch on one, one key thing here is a lot of the time people think that if we recycle something or if, if somebody else puts a system in place that it's the best system, right? So we would all probably think that recycling is a really great thing and we should do more of it. I am of the opinion recycling is a terrible idea. Let me explain why. Because when we create a system intervention like recycling that completely alleviates anybody's responsibility from this system, it creates a cognitive uh, okay switch to create the waste. So what happens is every society where you have an increase in recycling, you have an increase in the use of disposable materials. So net, the net impact is more waste. And the problem is, is that recycling is, a, is not a, what's the word, perfect system. And we have a lot of um, failures in this system, one of which was very obviously brought to light in 2018 when the Chinese government decided to no longer accept the world's plastic waste and the entire recycling industry collapsed. So right now we still have that. So we have stockpiled materials. Uh, only 9% um, uh, of all plastic ever produced ever has been recycled. 91% has never been recycled. So we live in this system where we've created the solution 
that makes the problem of disposability and you're all, I'm sorry to, to shame you all for your disposable masks, those of you who are wearing them, but this is a huge problem right now. Like our safety is obviously important, but we're creating these bigger problems because we've normalized the idea that we can create waste. So basically one of the, I'm not, I don't want anyone to um, feel bad, just buy a reusable. <laughs> That's the solution. Um, but I want you to think about this because I think it's very easy for us to individually not see that our individual actions has this cumulative effect. And that's the reality. All these big problems that we face, they're just the cumulative outcome of small decisions by many people. And there's a great tool that we use in, in environmental um, uh, impact assessment called life cycle thinking or life cycle assessment, which gives us like a snapshot of the whole life of something. So rather than just seeing something as it's like, this is a, a wonderful machine that does all these things for me, you have to understand all the way back to the conception of all the materials, the resources, the processes that went into creating it. And doing this gives us this holistic perspective of how something exists in the world across its whole life and what kind of impact it has. So then we can compare the true value of say, a like 100 disposable masks versus 100 reusable ones, and maybe even understand then if in a certain case the disposable is more beneficial, in some cases it is, than the reusable because the reusable means you have to wash it and it's had to grow the cotton. So that's, this is a kind of very um, uh, nerdy way of assessing at a very kind of uh, macro level the impacts of our actions as a species. And then what we can do is we can take that information and we can turn it into designing products and services that reconfigure the way we deliver goods in the economy. And so this is called sustainable design and it's been one of my uh, personal career goals to advance this idea that there are all of these strategies that we can put into place whether it be how we uh, design uh, an actual physical product or whether it be how we design an experience or how we create, um, create uh, our lifestyle actions, right? Like we have the opportunity to optimize, just as nature optimizes life, optimize uh, resources and value. So this whole concept is about changing things um, from going from a linear, uh, redu reductive uh, way of thinking about the world to a productive, problem-loving, solutions oriented nature-respecting mindset shift. Um, and one of the things that, from a systems thinking mindset, always in, I always think of in my own life, is like, is this solution gonna create more problems tomorrow? Because a lot of the problems we face are just the reconfiguration of old solutions. So, the big challenge that we have is to not only learn from nature, to not only be more, um, to more even value things that come into our lives with more integrity, but to find a way of designing, whether it be in our own lives or in our jobs, designing products, services, and solutions that help create a more regenerative world, where we give back more than we take. Can you imagine what the world would look like if rather than just taking things that are available to us, we figure out how to take and give back? That to me is like the ultimate goal of our species. We've developed the most incredible technologies. We've, we've managed to do phenomenal things but at a, lot, at a very high cost. So I believe that we're all citizen designers of the future. Every action that we have gives us the opportunity to redefine value in our own lives and the, the lives of those around us. And, they, and essentially, we have the opportunity to design the future through our actions today. And if I can leave you with one um, simple memory of my talk, it's that we live in magic because it's the only known life-sustaining planet in the entire universe. And as long as that is the case, then no matter how crappy things get, we should always remember that there's an opportunity to keep making the magic going. So thank you so much for your time. Oh yeah, I was right on time, right? I'm bang on time. I'm a pro, man, look at that. We started at five past. <laughs> Questions? Yes. Getting water. Outside, top down and bottom up, right? So, but again, we Dynamic have... engagement, yes. Yeah, but, so, but we all live in the middle, right? So now squeeze in the middle as citizen designers. So um, my, que my question is, so if we have, if, would we have to change or if I understand, you know, like perfect, it's like the, the mindset, right? It's yeah. 
traditional unity you can be doing the same thing over and over again. So where, where does that leave us now? Meaning that, do you think that the current condition that has features like if you want, uh, you know, short circuited a little bit, you know, um, everyone's uh, needs and, and uh, their expectations, you know, are really on the common ground. Do you think that this is an opportunity, this moment, let's say? Yeah, of course. I think that no one knows the answer to that. And the thing is, is that I believe in the potential for us to not make more problems. I believe in that because otherwise I would not get out of bed in the morning. And I believe in that also because I've seen humanity throughout the history of all of the stuff we understand is constantly being able to solve problems. Now, whether or not we create solutions that just delay the responsibility to other generations, which has been the operator, operation, um, you know, modus operandi for the last, you know, 70 years, um, or whether we figure out how to not only change our mindset, so it's not just thinking differently, it's actually interacting with the world differently, but that we actually change the values of what is seen as valuable in the world. So what is culturally appropriate, you know, what is the kind of values that we pass on to other, we've seen this, right? Like, I'm a woman, not that long ago, it would not be possible for me to be given my position of like articulation and power, not what I wouldn't be able to get a PhD, I wouldn't be able to do the role that I play in the world. And it's not that long ago that this cultural shift occurred. And we're seeing that right now with the reconfiguration of the value of people who are of a different um, uh, uh, you know, uh, representation to, to the dominant white ideology. So I feel like we are in constantly in a state of flux and we are as a species reconfiguring what is right and wrong and valuable and what is appropriate. And us, us uh, understanding that we are reliant on nature, that we are part of this natural world is a biological reality. It's not, a, it's not something you can argue out of, although there are probably some people who would try very hard to do so, of which I suggest they just hold their breath and see what happens, because this is the reality. We are biological beings. So for me, the biological imperative to sustain life, because we are part of nature, it's within us to optimize life. So I think it's, it's always possible, and I truly believe that we will find a pathway out of this chaos, whether it happens with a tragedy, whether it happens with something more positive um, is going to be determined by the willingness of people to take action. Um, and also I think that the current situation is so, uh, what's the word, um, sensitive. We're so, it's so sensitive to us all still. Like we are all still with fear and with concerns and with, un with all personal, oh, it's like a mess. Everyone's in an existential crisis, right? Like that's the reality. And so I think it's also still very hard to really judge because we're in the middle of this chaos, how it's going to be. I think we can all act with integrity, with respect, and honor this idea that something better will come out of this if we focus on something better coming out of it and working towards that. So that's how I see it, because I, I don't have any other powers of crystal ball reading <laughs> to see it as anything different. I have a lot of hope, though. You have a lot of hope. Yeah, and whiskey. They work well together. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions? I, I would like just to say something because um, I work in an educational department here in the, the museum, and we fight a lot of this good idea that I found very interesting that we are not teaching anymore the children the word recycle because so many years we were brainwashed to recycle and recycle means we are improving and creating the idea that we can throw away and waste it and then the factories will solve it for us. And they waste a lot of energy, like electricity and the, the levels of uh, money, economical level that they spend to recycle and transform the, the material is much higher than producing new yeah. materials sometimes. So we, we start with the same year to, to increase this idea of the reducing. And reusing, and yeah. And read something, redesign, redo something. The other thing with recycling that um, always shocks me is that the economic burden is on us. So whilst the producer creates the product that they then sell into the market, 
and then the government makes the regulations around what's the appropriate thing to happen to that product, we fit the bill, the cost, of that whole system. So we pay for the trucks to come to our house, we pay for the government to set up these things, because even if it's a private enterprise who's benefiting from, say, cardboard recycling, there's still the economic burden on us of producing waste. And we all pay for that. And we pay for it in hard money, and we also pay for it in lost resources, because it is actually not possible to infinitely recycle things. Like, materials break down. That is what nature is all about. It breaks things down. And so, like, paper usually can only be recycled around five times. The fibers get too weak, and then it goes back into the natural environment. And so that's why I'm kind of challenging. It's like, recycling isn't inherently bad. In fact, it is a good solution in certain circumstances, but it's not the only solution. And furthermore, we have to see the big picture for that to make sense, right? Like, we have to be able to see the whole system rather than, okay, I'm in this country and I can ship my waste to this country and they'll deal with it and I'll just pay them the right fee. And, you know, and so it's just kind of this deflection of responsibility has, like you say, almost been like reinforced in our cultural narrative. Like, I, I, I have been in a supermarket and I've refused something that's paper. And people will say, but it's recyclable. And I'm like, don't even start me. But that statement, it's recyclable, but it's recyclable. Like, it's good. We've all been told this is good. Therefore, it's OK. Well, OK, in certain circumstances, that's great. But in others, you've just justified a completely irrelevant choice that I don't need. So do you see what I mean? It's like, and that's that whole thing about the value, the cultural value of like, like changing the way we, we, okay, recycling's good in certain circumstances, but it's not a blanket solution to this very complex waste generating world. So my goal is this idea of post-disposable. Like what does a future look like that doesn't have disposability in it at all? Like we don't need to talk about recycling or reusing, we need to talk about like how do we design everything so that it does not have disposability in it? Because right now everything is designed for disposability. Like I have worked with designers who are designing disposable toasters, like cell phones are optimized to, to go um, to break after. So like this is intentional because it's the economy. GDP is all about growth and continual growth. So we've designed this whole system with this apparatus that reinforces this idea that there will be an infinite supply of natural materials that we can infinitely produce and turn it into value that we sell to consumers who will then waste it. Don't worry about that because someone else will deal with it. And we'll just go back to our infinite pool of natural resources, which is not the case. We're running out of heaps of natural materials, whether it be copper or beryllium or some of these harder to find metals. But that whole system is so well engineered to benefit this idea that we are doing the right like, thing, that it's, it's now this like, kind of reconfiguring it is, is kind of like shocking, right? Like, oh shit, like, we've done this thing, we thought it was good and it's not good. So there's like this process of kind of coming to terms and there is a lot of work being done on redesigning products and services, but it's, in my opinion, the easiest solution is to just recon make companies close the loop on the way they produce things. And there's been laws here in Europe that have tried to encourage that for at least a decade. Um, and some progress has been made, but a lot of companies still go find loopholes. So they'll, they'll make a product recyclable in one market and not in another. And so it, you know, it's still in this, like the moral responsibility for dealing with the waste of a product should be on the producer of that product, not on us as consumers. So that's what the problem with recycling is. It gives, it gives the agency, away, it deflects it away from the people who are responsible for the decisions, which is the companies that benefit from us buying their goods and from us not realizing that they're selling us a bigger problem, right? That's, yeah. But why do you think these companies are doing the boycott? Because of micro actions of individual people. And what we're seeing now is it's not just customers, it's workers. A lot of companies are seeing workplace activism. You see what happened with Amazon and their workers? And in the past when companies would kind of suppress that, and they'd say, oh, there's more workers where you came from. But now we're in a knowledge economy in a lot of industries. That knowledge economy changes the power dynamic. 
So the individual is no longer expendable because they're just a labor merchant, but they're actually with a certain type of unique skill set. And so the voice of the individual working within the company is saying, well, we don't want to work for a company that's not adhering to my values. And what we've seen in studies of, of, of generational divide is that whether you're a baby boomer, a millennial, or a Z-er, is that what they are now? That everybody cares about the world that they live in. They want the world to be a better place. They don't want it to be more polluted and more dangerous and more filled with concerns for their safety and their family members. They might have different political ideologies, but in the general gist, and so when it comes to the companies that they work for, they don't want to work for companies that are doing things that go against that personal goal. So what we're seeing is more and more of this workplace activism, people within companies standing up and saying, look, you know what, guys, like we should do something about this, rather than the pressure just coming from you know, the, the protesters at the door of the corporation. And I think that's a big shift that we hadn't seen in the past. And I'm, I'm, in, I'm inspired by this because for the first time in a long time, these companies are listening and they're taking action. How, in, how uh, long term, how powerful, how deep, how real, this is yet to be seen, okay? This is yet to be seen. But again, no crystal balls here, so we don't know, yeah. Okay, any more questions? Or? Well, it was a pleasure working with you for this hour. <laughs> My pleasure. Now, because of COVID, I'm putting this here so we know that I used this glass. <laughs> I'm gonna put my mask back on. And.